You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. For the last six years, my custom has been to invite the mayor of the city of Cincinnati to join me on a Sunday close to the end of the year to talk about the big picture. Being a creature of habit and combined with a rush of real issues and news in the last few weeks, I've invited Charlie Lucan, the mayor of, the, of Cincinnati, to join me this morning. Charlie, welcome to Newsmakers. Good welcome morning, back good. to Newsmakers. Yeah, thank you very much. And happy holidays. Same to you. Um, rather than plunge right into where we're headed, let's just, as you look at 2002, what is it that you feel best about in terms of the city? 2002 is a year of setting foundations. I mean, we got a new city manager, a new uh, method of city council, um, and we had to set priorities and, and deal with issues, and I think we, it's a year of kind of re-inventing re, uh, City Hall, and I think we've done that, and now in 2003, I think we're ready to fly. So uh, I think it's been a very good year from that point of view. Uh, but I can't, you know, there, there have been many good things that have happened, but uh, some bad things that have happened. But overall, I think we set the foundation for the future. How, do you, how, are, how is your relationship with the city manager, Valerie Lemmy, working out at this stage? I think great, and I think she would say the same thing. Um, th this, this system, like any system, Dan, is a, a, a creature of personalities. And... Uh, Valerie and I fortunately get along very well and we work together and and the charter as you know is is a little ambiguous about how it works the good news is that she and I just kind of share responsibilities and aren't too worried about the the technical po points in the law so it has worked very well from our point of view what in 2002 has been most disappointing for you crime there, there's just no question that the crime problem in the city uh, has uh, continued to, to, to be a, have a serious impact on our neighborhoods. And um, it's, it's, it's a phenom all over the country. I mean, if you've seen the gangs in L.A. are back stronger than ever, and there's murders in Oakland and Pittsburgh, et cetera. But for, for Cincinnati's point of view, we've always prided ourselves on being one of the safest cities in America. I think we still have the opportunity to return to that. But crime has been, has been my number one disappointment and been the number one thing that has made progress in the in our community difficult and I the budget calls for the addition of 75 new police officers and I had John Cranley and Mike DeWine last week talk or Pat DeWine pardon me uh, talking about um, the budget and we talked about this in some depth I mean there's there's a 75 new police what else besides police has to happen to for this community to get a handle on crime a couple of things uh, first of all the, the, the communities, where the communities have responded and worked with police, the problem is not nearly so bad. For example, in Madisonville, and Madisonville's she, seen its share of difficulty over the years, but they have this partnership with the officers in District 2. Violent crime is down 12%. Evanston, same kind of thing. But the model is the, the police, the citizens on patrol, working with the police, identifying problems, and working together to uh, solve them. We don't have that model working all over the city. That's supposed to be what our collaborative agreement is all about. 2003, again, has set the foundation of 2002. 2003, uh, we're ready to go. How many neighborhoods is that sort of model working in now? Actually, it's, it's working in District 2 of the best. The, 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 there are seeds of it in Price Hill and Pleasant Ridge and other places, but um, Evanston and, uh, and uh, Madisonville, because of the weed and seed money. Is, is done the best. Will 2003, is there the money there to expand that significantly? There is, but it's not only a question of money, Dan, it's just a question of, of, of citizens on patrol and getting people out and getting them energized to, to, to getting them participate. Organized. Yeah, and, and crime, crime goes, they're blips over the right. years, you know, and it's hard to identify this. If we do this, crime's going to go down. Uh, and, and as I said, this is a national phenom, but I think if we approach this, we can get back to the days when Cincinnati was one of the safer places in the country. Well, when we're talking about crime, one of the issues, obviously, is police. And this sure. week, uh, the whole question of the FOP contract came up. When the city administration took the freshly negotiated FOP contract to city council last week, 
things got complicated, although council quickly approved the contract that called for a 5% increase in 2003 and 2004 for rank and file officers, they balked over the contract that covered assistant chiefs. These four officers are the only top level administrators in the city government who are members of a union bargaining unit. 12 News reporter Paula Todi prepared this report about the debate that ensued and the potential aftermath. I think it's a sad day for uh, the Cincinnati Police Division. I think it's a very sad day for the city. Uh. Tonight, most Cincinnati police officers do have a new contract with new raises. But off camera told us it's all for one and one for all, and they don't like the fact their supervisors have been left out. The FOP vice president has called it union busting. Councilmember Pat DeWine calls it listening to the voters who want assistant chiefs removed from civil service protection. We took an oath of office uh, to uphold the charter and this is inconsistent with what the Charter says. There was no debate over whether it's legal to negotiate a contract that violates the Charter. The debate was over whether it would be ethical or good for the city. The mayor says a last-minute switch is not good for police morale. The police union says at the very least there will be legal consequences. I'm not going to ask for a slowdown. I don't have to. The guys are going to take it on themselves probably because they're that angry at this city council. I'm going to tell them to be very professional, which is what they are, and hopefully that's what they'll do. But I can't guarantee you anything. If council's opinion is that we have more work to do, then that's what we'll have to do is go back and, and apply ourselves there. But a new deal is certainly not a done deal. The FOP is under no obligation to negotiate away what was already agreed to. Charlie, this is a complicated issue. It certainly is. And it's I, very complicated. And I, I, let's, let's, I want you to have a chance to respond to a number of, of things that were said. Um, first off, uh, Pat DeWine's point that how can, how can council approve something that seemingly flies in the face of what the voters passed as a charter amendment just over a year ago, what was called Issue 5? I don't think it does. I mean, if you look at the commercials for Issue 5, one of the things they kept saying is it won't affect any union contract. This was all in the union contract. Now, the, the issue is whether we're going to be able to fire at will three or four people in the category of assistant chiefs. And then I just think it's all being litigated. It's all in litigation now and arbitration and all these issues as a result because of Because the FOP Twitty. went to court <coughs> it's a result long of Colonel, before this. It's a result of Colonel Twitty's departure from right. City Hall. That all aside for just one minute, mm -hmm. collective bargaining is the process of give and take. And in my view, we, we got some important things in this contract. I mean, you've talked, you've had people talking about this arbitration process. The right. city loses all the time. We can't get rid of any bad cops. We have a new system. The FOP agreed to help us deal with that issue. How did they do that? What's, the, what's new about the system? We have six arbitrators, some from the, half from the city, half from, from outside the city. We are allowed to engage in discovery so we don't get surprised on, on the day of the arbitration. Uh, we think with this new panel, we won't get blindsided so often. Uh, we'll be able to prepare better, have a, a more, better interaction. Um, I'm not sure it's going to work completely, but the good news is the FOP said, yeah, we're going we're to give on this. They never, you know, we also got some contributions on medical and some other things, and I just thought it was in the give and take of collective bargaining, this was a good deal. Let, let, and uh, you and I talked on the phone yesterday, and I talked to a lot of people on the phone yesterday because I was trying to understand this. My way of understanding things was that the city charter was like the city constitution. And that's not true. Okay. And why isn't that true? Why doesn't, why doesn't well, something added to the charter pr take precedence over everything else? Because there's a state constitution and the United States constitution, we get our rights from those. We don't get our rights from the city charter. And in state law, there was a decision in 1983 that, or thereabouts that uh, a, a union contract can trump a, a, something in a city charter. So however you define issue five, which is now in the charter, Mr. DeWine and a majority of council, seven members, believe it was worth rejecting the contract for supervise over that. Okay, so I, I just want to reinforce this. The city charter is not a constitution. It's the state constitution, and the city's a creature of the state, ultimately, even though we got home room, uh, home rule. And that's what I had to get my mind around. Yeah, well, and this is all kind of mind-numbing for, for people. But the, the, the bottom line is we don't have a contract with the supervisors in the, in the police department. Okay, now, we have to renegotiate if that. there was an old contract that said one thing, but that contract ran out, why can't we just start fresh and say, 
you know, now issue, this is different. It's no longer, it's not like collective bargaining, you know, they, they had an old contract, but that contract's over. Now we under a new world with issue five. Well, we can, and that's what council's instructed. Ah, okay. Council has instructed the administration to go back and renegotiate and say, in the union contract, completely implement what we think un issue five stands for. That's why we lost seven to two on Wednesday. Okay, so now you'll go back and renegotiate. Yes. And the goal will be to get these assistant chiefs, in effect, out of the bargaining unit? Well, they'll still be in the bargaining unit, but the discipline, if, if it's instituted, the disciplinary process in the contract will not apply to these assistant chiefs so that you can fi the city can fire them at will, okay. any time for whatever they want to do. What does the city, what is the city prepared to give in order to get, that's a big concession from the union's point of view. Absolutely, enormous concession, and, and one of the reasons that I didn't support what council did is because I don't know what else we have to get. It's no secret that in the collective bargaining process of give and take, you're going to ask them for something, you better be willing to give them something. Money. In this particular case, Dan, I hate to say it this way, we're tapped out. I mean, the city had a $35 million deficit. We just passed a budget that kind of cut and paste our way to, to dealing with that issue. And if people, are, if people want the FOP to give something, they're going to have to put something on the table. The only thing I know, working conditions, and money. That's about it. And I'm not sure how you're going to make concessions in those areas that won't have a serious negative impact on the budget. How quickly can you think this can be settled? I, I, I don't know. I mean, ultimately what happens, Dan, is you go to fact-finding. Okay. The, the law says you go to fact-finding if they can't work it out. And Pat DeWine, who kind of led this effort, is now on the bargaining team. Because what I didn't want the, was the bargaining team to come back and say, we couldn't get that concession and have council say we didn't try hard enough. So I've said, okay, you go sit there and make sure that your position's being asserted vigorously. Okay, next issue that I want to, to move on to, and that's the, the decision finally about the monitor. A brief and stormy relationship with the first court appointed monitor to oversee the collaborative agreement resulted in the withdrawal of Alan Kalmanoff. Last week, after some tough negotiations, all the parties, the city, the Black United Front, the ACLU, and the FOP, all agreed on the selection of Saul Green, a former U.S. attorney from Detroit. You really need the, the community involved. You need the faith community. You need schools. You need businesses all pulling together uh, to, to work on these issues. I think that's really what the collaborative agreement in Cincinnati is about. Charlie, have you met Mr. Green yet? I have not. Okay. Uh, but he was originally one of the city's choices to be the monitor, so we're happy with the selection. It sounds like this time what is different is that all four elements, all four groups in the, in the collaborative partnership, which I listed there before, have all agreed on Saul Green. Is that correct? Whereas before, the judge had to step in. The, the judge did step in last time. We have all agreed. and in, this, in in the opinion of all the parties, this, the last few weeks has been the most collaborative period of the collaborative. So people were working together, and that's a good sign. If I read the newspaper correctly on Friday morning, it sounds like even Ken Lawson was saying that he is siding with you about the, the fees to Kalmanoff. And it sounds like you even have collaboration on that issue. I'll have to change my opinion then. No, I, I, think, uh, I think everybody agrees that the, uh, the uh, charges were excessive. The, the, the other change made for Mr. Green is that we will simply escrow money with the court. We have capped our involvement in paying for the monitor. We're going to escrow money for the court. The bills are going to be submitted to the court. The court's going to monitor, arbitrate, as it were, those fees. So we're not going to have this situation. You really can't have a monitor come in like Kalmanoff did and get beat up by counsel and then expect to go out and monitor the agreement. So we've changed that process too. Okay. Hang on just a minute. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. After the break, we'll discuss what might be coming up in 2003. Welcome back. Uh, Charlie, uh, lots of other issues um, here towards the end of the year. One of those is that, uh, that you have made an appointment 
to the sort of board or recommend it to the sort of board. You have recommended the appointment of your father. Correct. Tom Lucan, former congressman, former mayor, former councilman, former everything in this city, to be a member of the sort of board. Um, sent that over to the county commission, who makes the, well, actually, and it hasn't been voted on. No, but one, one, there was something in the middle. Council approved it nine to nothing. Okay. So council approves it nine to nothing. The, our agreement with the county says that the city gets, will recommend four appointments and the county shall confirm those four. Four appointments to a nine member member Correct. board. Okay. Um, now, I've never really heard whether the county commissioners object to the appointment of my father. They, they have taken the position and asked the prosecutor for an opinion as to whether our four are simply recommendations or whether they have to confirm our appointments. The implication, of course, is that they do not want to confirm my father. So that's where we are. Once, once it went Why over the Why have county, you selected your father? Because you know and I know your father was <laughs> very unhappy with Metro's proposal this fall for the expanded bus and light rail well, system. Well, Dan, he wasn't the only one. 67 percent of, I, of I the, realize of the that. taxpayers were. So my point is that my, my decision to appoint my father was a guy who who was around and actually architected the first ever public support for the bus company in the city, a guy who understands mass transit from his work in the Congress, a guy who's a pretty good watchdog of taxpayer money, and a guy who's not just going to say, okay, let's do whatever the sort of administration wants us to do, is going to ask some very tough questions. This, this Metro Moves plan, this light rail plan, was defeated uh, you know, by almost two-thirds of the voters, so it was time to get some different thought on the board. That was my thinking. Okay. Play devil's advocate. We also know that your father can be as aggressive as any person I've ever met, in term, even with his friends. And, and even his children. And his children, okay. And his employees. <laughs> and um, some people would say, I'll, I'll just be blunt, some people would say that you made this appointment to punish Metro for even putting that on the ballot? Uh, I've learned not to respond to some people, but the, but the fact is that the sort of board has got to take a new direction, be more inclusive in their thought process, and we need to, you, you also remember that during the campaign, I thought they were wasting taxpayer money with these commercials that I thought should not be funded with taxpayer money. I mean, there is no one on that board right now that is challenging on a regular basis, what's going on there. Now, it, my father is tough. My re response to that, good. It, he's one of nine members. I mean, the notion that he, that one member out of nine is going to control that board seems to be, everybody seems to cower. And from my point of view, we need some good thought. We need some different approaches. And, uh, you know, this is a guy that's got a better resume in terms of the city than anybody I know, and he knows the city. So let, let him serve to a non-compensated board. In, in the best interest of the city. John Cranley sent a letter on Tuesday to county commissioners saying approve Tom Lucan and our other uh, recommendations or we may not fund the Met we may not fund Metro beyond one more month. No that's not I, I wasn't involved and frankly I'm not sure it was the, the the wisest decision but what he said was under no circumstances will we interrupt bus service what, what I think what he, he talked about a council, and I have never seen the letter, what he talked about a council was we won't let SORTA run the buses. We will get another entity because it is all city taxes that goes to, for the local match of the uh, of public transit. So the threat is in this letter that you would pull the 0.3% city earnings tax that funds the bus system from SORTA and give that to some other entity. That is that is the threat. I've never seen the letter, and not sure that's the best strategy. My my attitude is let's let's all kind of take a deep breath. Let's let the lawyers from the prosecutor's office respond. Talk to our lawyers, see what they say, and take this one step at a time. I'm not interested in in, in the demise of SORTA. I'm not interested in pulling funding. Uh, I do think the city should have four appointments as we've had for decades to the sort of board. 
Is there any real threat that the metro service will be disrupted? Not while I'm the mayor, no. I mean, you know, look, this is a, this is a, this is a game that's inside baseball. The only thing that the, the guy that, or woman that rides the bus knows is the bus there on time. And I am unwilling, and I think everybody's unwilling, to have that person's ride on the bus interrupted by this squabble between the city and the county. Yeah, and you know, it's inside baseball, but it's this continuing it's city going county on, business. It's been going on for two or three months. And, and I have to say one th other thing, and that is that I was surprised by it all. I mean, I, I knew that there would be some eyebrows raised when I appointed my father. But I never thought it was even an issue whether the city had four appointments. We've been doing it for decades. It, nobody's ever, it's always just been a matter of form, and it's always just happened. Okay. One of the uh, proposals that has come to council, and I don't think you've had a, a chance to, I know you haven't had a chance to respond to it, is a proposal out of the Chamber of Commerce for a joint uh, committee on technology and innovation and commercialization uh, with the county to right. try to, you know, jumpstart uh, technology in this region, not just in the city, but in this region. And I'm on the board of that group. Jonathan Hollifield right. and uh, Jonathan's good friend and has sent this to me and what's your reaction to that? I think it's great. Um, technology is evidenced by the NASDAQ hasn't exactly taken off the way it did a few years ago, but I still think that the future of employment and job growth is going to be in technolo technology related fields. So I think it's a, it's a good partnership and I think we should do it. The only, the only question I have, Dan, is the same question I have about a lot of these things, how much? And I, you know, what's the city's uh, cash involvement gonna be? But um, I'm on the board and I, he's talked to me about it and Jonathan Hollyfield, as you know, is a guy that's gonna go get him. So uh, I, I, I think we're former, gonna- Former running back with the Bengals for people who don't too. remember. He's, right. he's a very big guy. That's right, so I'll do <laughs> very what he impressive. says. Yeah. Uh, so you, you this whole area of, of economic development, one of the other things that's in the budget and you commented on in the last couple of weeks, is the importance of arts and culture institutions. Right. Right. Is this, is this you, you are now the mayor and have a chance to, in, a new, in a new way, or is this a new insight for you? I mean, arts? It, the importance of the arts mm. economically to the city, because I think that's what's Actually, I mean, I, Actually, it's not a new insight, but I have to say that it's important was heightened during the campaign. I ran against Curtis Fuller, and, and Curtis, Curtis had a platform about this. We began to dialogue about it, and now the city, as a result of the budget that I just submitted, is much more involved in, in, the, in the success of arts organizations. We are providing funding for large and small arts organizations. And when you look at a neighborhood like Over the Rhine, Dan, let's just say, that we can get that art academy. They want to move down to over the run. Let's say you get 220, 300 artists working there. Most of them are going to want to live there. Uh, the opportunity for the arts to revive, revive neighborhoods, to provide economic development, to continue to bring people downtown. I mean, think about it. Everybody talks about Newport or Covington or wherever it might be. The arts are within a few blocks of where we are. They're not going anywhere. They are distinctly Cincinnati, city of Cincinnati, and they're a, tre a tremendous economic development tool. And the good news is the foundation's so strong. I mean, we have arts organizations, and I'm not, this is not a matter of opinion. We have arts organizations that are way better than Indianapolis, Columbus, Cleveland, you name it, any city our size. So we have the foundation to, to really make this work for the city. You know, uh, one of the things coming out of that world, that's, what, that's the world I've always worked in, you know, this city has always been way behind in terms of its public support for the arts. And, and th what you had did in this budget is a significant break, and I think people need to, to understand that this is an investment in, in a way that the city has never invested before. It is a, an investment of a magnitude we've never made before. Some of the folks in the neighborhood say, why are you doing that much for the arts organizations? I just hope that people understand the relationship between the arts and culture and economic development. If we're going to continue to have a strong tax base, we have to identify those things about the city that are unique to us and support them. The arts brings more people downtown than all the sports events. Well, Charlie, 
thank you very much. Have a good holiday. Thanks. Good 2003. I think, to, I I think to 2003 is going to be terrific. For us. Okay, and hope to see you back here Thanks, a lot. Steve. Happy okay. holiday. Okay. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us next week, and we'll focus on the constitutional crisis facing the Ohio funding of public schools. But have a good holiday this week, and see you then.